Are you looking for a place to come where you can find a friend in financial services? Somewhere you can go to get the real information about the economy, unbiased and unabridged, so you know where to go with your money? Well, tonight on The Master of Money, we're going to be talking about technology and technology investing. So if you've ever looked at robotics, artificial intelligence, and the advanced technologies, join us for this edition of The Master of Money. Master of Money is brought to you by Harvest Investment Services, a registered investment advisor where they harvest gains and minimize losses, and by Superstock Investor, bringing institutional research to individuals. Today's Master of Money program was produced Tuesday, May 19, 2015. Welcome, my friends, to the Master of Money program, the show that is all about helping you down your journey of financial and economic empowerment. I'm Steve Beeman, and it is my honor to join you each and every week to help show you on this journey where the rubber meets the road, where we can sift through all of the garbage in the news of the week and show you where it truly matters to you and your family's wealth. On tonight's program, we're going to be talking about a subject that it's got a lot of sex appeal, it's frankly a very high return area, but it's fraught with risks. We're going to be talking about technology investing. The fact of the matter is you and I both see how fast technology is changing this world. We see automation. We see cryptocurrencies coming out. We see globalization happening. We see a brand new economy building. We don't often know where that leads. Well, on tonight's program, I'm going to talk to you about some of the fundamental technologies that are taking place, as well as the application of those fundamental technologies that will change the way you and I live our lives. And the best news, I'm going to show you ways that you can make money on that. On last week's program, my guest and I, Tim Newell, talked with you about putting meaning into your money. We talked with you about how building a legacy with your money can bring real meaning and satisfaction to many people through comprehensive financial planning. We also talked with you about how to plan on succession planning is the word we used and how that can be used to build real wealth for your children and your grandchildren. And finally, Tim and I talked about very specific ways that you can cheat the tax man and get more control over the money that you want to use to reward those institutions that have been beneficial to you. Well, as always, if you have questions about that program, I welcome you to write me directly at questions at safefinancial.org. And frankly, if you want to see any of the other Master of Money programs in addition to that one, you can go right to our website at www.safefinancial.org and click on the Safe Financial Network and go up and view the archives of the Master of Money as well as our Safe Insights. Now, looking at member questions this week, we had a member who wrote in, and this member and I had a long chat, and you know who you are, so I hope you enjoy tonight's program, because the discussion motivated me to do tonight's program. Many, many people, especially when you get to be my age and 50 and up, look at the technology change that we're experiencing and think it won't really affect them. They look at it and say, this is so far out in the future that it won't change the way I live my life. Well, I beg to differ with you. The technology changes that are happening today in applied technologies and raw technology are going to impact the way you and I live in the near term, not just the long term. So tonight's program is dedicated to that viewer, and we hope that you sit back and enjoy it. But I would also welcome some of you to buckle up your seatbelts for this one, because you may find it a little bit disturbing. Well, moving as we do into the geopolitical arena, last week I was interviewed by Newsmax Television, as I frequently am with my host, Ed Berliner. Ed and I had a chance to talk about the major geopolitical things going on in the world, and I wanted to relate that conversation with you. The first thing we talked about is a move that's being made by Russian President Vladimir Putin to kick out companies from that country that he deems undesirable. Now that is kind of a weird statement if you think about it at its core. One man determining that that's an undesirable company? 
Well, the fact of the matter is, as Mr. Putin's economy has suffered, you and I have talked about the impact of low oil prices on Russia. Well, as his economy suffers, he's looking for ways to keep the Russian population in check. And he's become almost xenophobic with it. Well, we hope that for the Russian economy, that doesn't prove to be even more damaging. But the question specifically to me last week was, to what extent will this affect the U.S. economy? My answer to Newsmax and my answer to you is I don't think it'll affect it that much. Most American companies doing business in Russia are desirable by Mr. Putin's standards because he needs them. So I don't see any real effect from Russia's moving to a Russia first policy. The second thing we talked about was China. You and I have talked at length about China's growth, how they're now the world's largest economy, not a surprise given their population. But in addition to that, they've aggressively been moving around the world to build bigger and stronger trade relations from Asia into Europe, South America, and everywhere else. Well, just last week, it was announced that the Chinese were making a $50 billion infrastructure investment into Brazil. Now, this isn't really a surprise. Brazil is part of what are called the BRIC countries. That's Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And so for China to make an infrastructure investment into Brazil, isn't a surprise. Back to the question that Newsmax wanted me to answer, how will that affect American companies? I told them I think it's a net positive. Brazil being in the Western Hemisphere is part of our growth plan, and to the extent Brazil's economy grows, well, that's going to benefit U.S. companies as well. So this is certainly not a negative. It's not a surprise, but we should look for China to be making those types of investments even more around the world. And third and finally on the Newsmax program, we talked about the malaise being felt in the American economy, how the first quarter numbers just came in as a disaster. And the question put to me was, to what extent do I think that will reverse second, third, and fourth quarter? Well, the reality is, I think it will reverse. We're almost getting to that first quarter being a new norm of being a bad quarter. Second quarter, third, and fourth, I would look for the U.S. economy to get back to two and a half, maybe even 3% growth rates, notwithstanding that we are expecting maybe a quarter point increase in interest rates in the third quarter from the Federal Reserve. But we've seen some real strong statistics as undercurrents. Now, again, you and I have talked about this bipolar economy. I'm not going to get all overly optimistic on you, but there are some numbers that seem to be, seem to be pointing to a little bit of development in the economy. But we wait and see what happens in Europe, what happens in Russia, what happens in China, South America, and South Asia before we make any definitive moves. Right now, I can tell you, look for a 25 to 3% growth rate in the U.S. economy throughout the balance of the year. Moving into the economic sector, I want to continue on this idea of the economic malaise in the United States. We have a lot of cross signals. One of the most powerful is housing starts. Pre-2008, we would sell in the month of March, for example, maybe a million units. Well, this March, we did under 500,000 units on a seasonally adjusted basis. That shows you the core housing starts are not that strong. We have a lot of those kind of currents going on, and I think it's driven mainly by fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's in the American consumer. If you look at the indexes that measure confidence, and we've talked about the Michigan index and other consumer confidence indexes, those are hovering around stable levels, but they don't seem to be wanting to trend upwards. So as confidence in the U.S. economy isn't really there, you're not going to see a resurgence in growth to that economy. Now, the second thing that comes into that is we have seen an environment since 2009 of a much tighter credit world. Well, that credit is affecting home ownership as well. You can get loans and rates, as you know, are at all time lows, but it's a little tougher to get credit and we don't have people doing the desktop underwriting like they were doing in the mid 2000s. So with that tighter credit, with the instability caused by so many geopolitical things, again, Americans are kind of in a fear, uncertainty and doubt mode and that is causing the economy to kind of dribble along in this two to 3% range. Now, as I said, uh, we've been watching around the world, and I want to leave you with one final economic thing, and that's Greece. In, later, in the later programs, I've talked about how Greece this summer may default, and we're all watching that because this could be the final straw that breaks Europe's um, back. However, Greece is now saying here in the month of May they may run out of cash, 
and that will be precipitous damage to the euro. So we're keeping an eye on that. And I want to relate, I'm going to uh, digress a little bit here, but two weeks ago, three weeks ago, you and I talked about currency trading. We talked about some of the risks in currency trading, and I want to give you one that just played out. Most trading models had the euro devaluing against the U.S. dollar. Well, they were betting for that, when in reality, in the last two weeks, the euro's come up against the dollar. So most currency traders, many of them at least, have been getting their heads handed to them trading in these currencies because they forecasted the movement of the euro wrongly. Well, we're all waiting for Greece to collapse. That's almost inevitable. But you don't want to be on the side of a losing currency trade. So go back to that master of money in the archives if you'd like to brush up on that just a little bit. In the markets last week, all three of the major indexes closed in record territory. We have the S&P above 2,100, the Dow above 18,000, and the NASDAQ above 5,000. That's really strong. And many of the short-term technical indica indicators continue to see strength in the markets. Now, we've talked with you how many times about risk controls because that can change. But right now, the technical indicators seem to still be bullish for the markets. Now, in a preview of tonight's show, I want to give you some of the big movers from last week because I thought this was interesting as what I'm talking about does tend to follow the news. Last week, if you look at the most active, biggest moves in the market, you had Apple Computer with the release of the Apple Watch coming out, driving that stock to even ever increasing heights. Apple seems to be the one technology company that keeps technological innovation alive. Cisco Systems, GE, and Applied Bioscience all did really well last week as tech companies seem to regain their foothold. Now, tonight's program is dedicated to that, so I thought you should get a few of those very powerful names. Now, in the final segment, as I try to bring you something of relevance, I want to talk about 401k plans. The society has been actively involved in 401k plan discussions for a year or two now, and the reason is the expanding, increasing liability for the business owner or the sponsor of the 401k plan. There are several things you should be aware of if you're an employer and if you sign off on that 401k document. First, the Supreme Court just this week, yesterday, came out with a decision that supports employer fiduciary liability on the plan. And the employees who sued claimed that the employers weren't putting the least cost funds in the options for them. That's a big deal. Secondly, even with all of the liability going on, we know that fully 20% of American companies still force their own company stock into employee 401ks. Now answer me this. If you think putting your stock into your employee's company's 401k meets a fiduciary standard, you need to write me at questions at savefinancial.org and I'll enlighten you as to the fact that it doesn't. You want to be increasingly careful with your 401k because there's a real magnifying glass being put on by the Department of Labor and the ERISA lawyers that it has. In fact, the society is sponsoring a major symposium in early June to talk to business owners about this liability trap and show them easy, inexpensive ways to get around it. Well, on tonight's program, sit back and stay with us. You're going to like this video. I changed up videos here at the midsection because I thought, I don't know if I've shown you this one before. I've used it in my public presentations, but I thought you might like to see it. It's a taste of where we're headed in technology. And when we come back, I'll talk to you about applied technology, raw technology, and how you can position your portfolio to be invested in the right place to make some money. So stay tuned for the second half of The Master of Money. Today, we have something extra special for you guys, and you guys will be some of the first people outside of our team and outside of Google to ever ride in it. Steering wheel in the way. <laughs> 
It was a big decision for us to go and start building our purpose-built vehicles for this. And really, they're, they're prototype vehicles. They were a chance for us to, to explore what does it really mean to have a self-driving vehicle. But in the small amount of time we've been working on it, you know, we have functional prototypes, and it's exciting. Oh, it's really cool. It was like really kind of a space age experience. Oh, okay. Hooray. We're like me. You sit, relax, you don't need to do nothing. It knows when it needs to stop, it knows when it needs to go. <laughs> it actually rides better than my own car. Yes, <laughs> sure. What she really liked was that it slowed down before it went around a curve and then accelerated in the, in curve. the curve. She's always trying to get me to do, do it that way. That's the way I learned in <laughs> high school driver's ed. So if I had a self-driving car, I could spend more time hanging out with my kids or helping them with their homework, even just tending to them, finding out how their day was and not having to wait till you get home and have dinner and all that. So it'll be good. Human feeling of it is very well engineered and it is very smooth. There's nothing that makes you feel the least bit threatened. It's impressive. I'm, I'm totally in love with this whole concept. <laughs> our, our lives are made up of lots and lots of little things. And a lot of those little things for most people have to do with getting from place to place and in order to connect and do things and be with people, go places that they need to go and do things. And uh, so there's a big part of my life that's missing and there is a big part of my life that a self-driving vehicle would bring back to me. This is the first step for us uh, and it's really exciting to see the progress we've made. The opportunity for people to just move around and, and not worry about it, it's going to be incredibly empowering and incredibly powerful for people. I love this. <laughs> Welcome back to the program, my friends. It's always good to have you with me. And as I said, this second half of the program, it might be unsettling to some people because we're going to talk about some really interesting new developments in the technology space. Ultimately, though, I'm going to talk to you about where you can put money to capture some of the returns generated by all this fascinating new stuff. Now, I want to explore two different segments of technology with you tonight. I want to talk about what I think of as raw technology and then applied technology, just to give you a flavor of where things are going. And in talking about raw technology, I want to talk about what is perhaps the most important thing that's happened in technology in its lifetime. And that is this. The heart of a computer is a semiconductor. If you go back into the 1960s, a semiconductor cost most of the price of the computer. Well, today, with the advancement of what's called Moore's Law and other laws of fundamental technology development, the cost of that semiconductor it's about the cost of this piece of paper. The prices have come down so far that you are now going to see what's referred to as ubiquitous computing. You're going to see semiconductor-based applications in everything, whether it's tables. You can go to Panera Bread right now and see a smart table that has a chip built right into it. You're going to see this kind of technology put into clothing, windows that automatically darken as the night gets out. You're going to see technology put everywhere because the cost of these semiconductors has come down so much. That's what makes the Apple iWatch possible even. The size has shrunk, the power has increased, and the cost has come way down. So the first raw technology that's going to change our lives is simply the ubiquitousness of semiconductor technology. Within the next few years, it is going to be everywhere. Secondly, using that expanded power and expanded technology is artificial intelligence. Now, many have thought for years whether we could build a thinking computer, and they've looked and said, well, you'll never beat a human brain. Well, IBM's Big Blue project has now beaten the chess masters, so we know a computer can beat people as it goes into chess. We've also had computers win in Jeopardy, <laughs> that famous TV show with Alex Trebek. So the intelligence of computers is expanding exponentially to the point where they now can hold a conversation with you. Are they perfectly able to think like we do? Not yet. 
but within the next few years, you're going to see robotics and artificial intelligence implemented in ways that you've never thought possible. And I'm gonna talk with you about some of that in just a moment. Third, to me, this is one of the most fascinating. I grew up and went to school in the 1970s. At that time, the periodic table of elements had, I think, 106 elements in it. Well, every period, you know, every few years, we find a new element. So it's grown, I think, I don't know how many are in it now, 112, 113, whatever that number is. But here's the point. Over time, we have discovered that the periodic table is not a single two-dimensional table of elements. In fact, it's three dimensions. Each one of those fundamental elements has what's known as an isotope or a different variation of it that gives whole new properties. So instead of having a two-dimensional table of um, periodic elements, we now have a three-dimensional table. And that's leading to the development of some new materials that are truly revolutionary to the way we live. Again, I'll give you specific examples of these as we move through the second half. And then fourth, I wanna to talk to you about advanced communication. Now, when you and I think about communication, we think about telephones. I wanna talk with you. Well, that's not quite what I'm talking about. What I'm referring to is advanced computer to computer communication, a world in which everything talks to everything else. The capability this brings to us is phenomenal. Whether it's clothing that reflects your heart rate and vital stats to your doctor, or it's cars that know how to drive down the road because they're communicating with all of the other cars, all of the roads, and even a uh, geo um, satellite. The fact of the matter is this advanced communication, when put in with these advanced new materials, taken with artificial intelligence and the ubiquitous nature of semiconductors, we are changing the very nature of how you and I live. And if you're, you know, again, I'm 54 years old, 53 years old, I forget how old I am sometimes, but you're gonna find in my lifetime, these technologies will change not just the nature of how I live, but the nature of economics. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Now, if we come down into how these raw technologies are applied, let's take a look at in the, one of the most interesting areas called 3D printing. 3D printing is a technology that allows you to use a printer, just a standard laser printer, and produce a product in three dimensions. So if you can give that printer the design of a coffee mug, it will replicate that coffee mug for you. If you give it a gun, it can also do that. 3D printing technology is not even in its infancy anymore. You can go down to a store and buy a 3D printer today for $500. This is not something that's out there yet to be discovered. It's discovered, it's put into practice, and it's made commercially available today. In fact, I've thought about getting one just to show on Masters of Money program how it works. You literally feed a design in, say produce this, and in a period of time it will produce that exact object for you. Now using 3D printing, we're looking at building models of the human body so that doctors have exact uh, knowledge of how to work in a human body. We're talking about building legitimate, um, what could be called organic things. For example, at MIT, they're working on doing a 3D printed cheesecake. The importance of that is that as I get older and I need replacements for my liver, for my heart, whatever, we're gonna be able to 3D print that. It's already doing that in things like tendons and bone areas where they need a part. We can replicate people's uh, part ne necessities. So this 3D printing, this isn't a future technology. It's here right now in play. And if you wanna run down to a store, I'll send you a name. So write me at questions at savefinancial.org and I'll give you the name of a store where you can buy a 3D printer and put one in your kitchen to make your coffee cups. The second thing using the applied um, artificial intelligence is robotics. Now, many of you who've grown up in industry have used robotics for years. Since the 50s and 60s, we've been using robotics to manufacture products. That's been a big reason for the decline in blue collar labor in the United States. When you have robots who can produce a product, you no longer need humans to do it. Well, robotics is exploding with AI and this idea of cheaper semiconductors. They are now building robots, obviously, to enter the fast food world. We're seeing that today in Seattle. 
They're building robots to be used as personal servants in Japan where they can actually help the invalid to deal with their day-to-day -day living. Robotics are here. This isn't a future technology, it's available. If you go out and you want to buy a robotic idea for your house, you can buy what's called, I think it's um, iRobot is the name of it, but it's a vacuum cleaner. It's a robotic vacuum cleaner, and it will vacuum while you're out at work each day. This technology is not in the future, it's here today. Now it is getting exponentially more powerful, so when you talk about robotics, you're going to see robot flown aircraft. We already have it. It's called autopilot. You're going to see robotic driven cars. Well, we already have those too. In fact, in one of the latest inventions of a disruptive technology, we are now creating and have put on the roads um, trucks with autopilot. Now let me share with you why this is important. As you look at robotics and you look at AI, look at the structure of an economy. How many people in this economy are going to have their jobs displaced imminently by these new technologies? What do you do when you no longer need a truck driver? Let's be honest, we replaced um, the, uh, what are they called, the engineers on trains many years ago. We don't need brakemen on trains anymore. We are fast approaching a time when manual labor across the board is replaced by automation. Now you can be scared by that, and that is a disruptive technology, or you can see it as an opportunity. As things get disrupted, new things will evolve, new ideas will emerge, new opportunities for making money will come onto the horizon, and that's what we're always going to try to find. Now the next, what I think of as disruptive or applied technology is again in this advanced materials. If you take a pencil, and you rub it sideways on a piece of paper, what you get is a single layer of carbon from that pencil. Well, researchers have discovered that a single molecule thick layer of um, graphite creates a new product called graphene. Well, graphene has certain interesting characteristics, one of which is it's an absolutely perfect filter for seawater. Graphene only lets H2O through it, so as you pour through it, it retains everything else and it's dirt cheap. This could revolutionize water needs around the world, not to mention the fact that graphene is stronger than steel, lighter than aluminum, and could revolutionize transportation. And when I say could, I'm not talking 30 years from now. Graphene research, what's called G research, in applied sciences is being used today. So we're seeing the application of these applied technologies today. I bought a car last year. I've joked with people that it will likely be the last car I ever buy that I drive. My next car, which I'll buy in some number of years, will likely be an auto drive car. They're almost commonplace anymore. They've driven over a million miles without any accident caused by the car. Think about auto accidents. What are they caused by? Human error. Well, robot driven cars don't make errors, and so you reduce auto accidents precipitously. You reduce the cost of driving precipitously. And we reduce the need to have signage everywhere. So from a visual pollution standpoint, we even clean that up. Well, we're headed there. And that stuff's available to us now. So when you look at this advanced technology development, it is in our lives now that it's taking place, let alone my kids' lives. But we don't want to be naive to it. We don't want to be scared of it. So what we want to do is look for places to make money. Well, when you invest in technology company, there are certain fundamental truths, and I want to mention three keys for you. First of all, profit still matters. Very few and far between are the companies that can operate perpetually on venture capital. So if you're looking at investing in a company that's in one of these technologies, don't get in on the bleeding edge. Try to get in after it's launched itself and has shown an ability to make commercial success. Sometimes they look really cool, but you can't make money on them, and that's not what we want to do. Secondly, valuation matters. Um, no company can violate the fundamental laws of economics, and if you get a technology company that looks like it has such beautiful opportunity, don't ignore the fundamental laws of valuation. If you think back one, maybe two weeks ago, I talked to you about Uber, this little taxi technology that is an application on your iPhone, and I think they have it valued at something like $40 billion. I'm sorry, in my opinion, you can replicate that app like that. 
I wouldn't put a $40 billion <laughs> on that if I had to. So you want to pay attention to valuations. You want to keep your sense about you. Don't kid all, get caught up in the excitement of it like we did in the bubble of 2000. Remember, um, it was Mr. Greenspan with his comment that we were experiencing irrational exuberance. Well, don't get irrationally exuberant when you look at the next hot new technology. A way to play the technology space is, of course, through a managed fund or an ETF. And you know here at the Society, I've preached to you about ETFs because I think they're an elegant way to make a play into a sector. And if you'd like to try to juice up your returns, accepting that there may be a little more volatility, well, let me give you three ideas in the technology space that you might want to consider. First is IGV, and that's iShares North American Technology ETF. This is an exchange-traded fund that buys at its core American technology companies, Microsoft, Apple, GE, Applied Materials, big companies that really do develop many of the patents that are going out into the world today. Number two, here's my favorite. The ticker symbol on this is HACK, H-A-C-K. And this is a company that specializes in cybersecurity. Well, that's certainly an area of growth for the world because as countries move away from traditional warfare to cyber warfare, and you have institutional crime looking at cyber crime, well, these companies that create um, security systems in the cyber area are gonna prosper greatly. So this hack is an ETF that supports the cyber side or the cyber um, security side of the technology industry. And the third is CQQQ. It's kind of an easy one to remember. That's an ETF that tracks Chinese technology companies. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I think about China and technology, I don't think about China developing the newest technology. China is extremely good at replicating technology and sometimes stealing it. But I wouldn't say they've been known as developing raw technologies. But this technology company looks for more of an applied technology going on in China, and that does open up huge markets for things like 3D printers, for things like self-driving vehicles, all of that is going to grow exponentially throughout the world as we bring the third world up into the second world. So those are three ideas for you. And those are all things that, again, they play in a space that is almost hard to imagine where it's leading. I spent hours and hours and hours culling through data to find out where and when we're going to start to see seismic changes in the global economy. We're already seeing it when the government publishes unemployment statistics and the best data is we're going to have at the end of this year about a 5.1% unemployment rate. Well, you and I both know that's not accurate. There's more like 15% unemployment, but a lot of people fall off the unemployment compensation rolls. Well, as this technology becomes more and more implemented, that structural unemployment rate's going to rise. It's economically not necessarily a problem because productivity will rise exponentially. The question is, what will an economy do when it doesn't need its people? Well, that's a question for another show, and we will certainly try to answer it for you one of these days. But for today, that's some thoughts on the nature of technology investing and where you can go to find out some opportunities that might fit within your portfolio. Of course, as always, ask your advisor or your professional friend if that makes sense for you. Well, join us next week for another new edition of the Master of Money show. But until then, have a happy, healthy, and prosperous week.